<clears throat> well, first of all, I, I thank you all for this wonderful opportunity. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you are. Let's see if I, oops. Ah, there we go. So first, let me begin by <clears throat> thanking you for this wonderful opportunity to come here tonight. This is my first time in Charleston, although I... Sorry, can you just raise the, oh, yeah. that mic up close to... That one? Yep, perfect. Okay. Uh, again, if you can't hear me, let me know. I've been talking a, probably too much today already. Um, it's my first time to Charleston and Eastern Illinois University, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I, I wish to thank Steve Mullen, Gary Fritz, Ann Fritz, and Mike Corey for this wonderful opportunity to come here today and talk to you uh, about some ideas that I have about cooperation and the benefits of cooperation in both uh, human and non-human primate evolution. Uh, to take this opportunity to wish Charles Darwin a, a, a very happy 203rd birthday. And I'm certain that if Charles Darwin um, would have been in attendance today if that was possible. It's my hope that he would support many of the ideas and thoughts that I'll present to you tonight and that he would appreciate how his contributions and insights continue to drive our current issues on primate behavior, primate biology, and evolution. Now I, I must acknowledge that I'm not an expert in Darwin, but I have spent the past 30 years studying the behavior, ecology, cognition and social systems of non-human primates, principally the monkeys of Central and South America. And as a biological anthropo uh, anthropologist, my focus is on using this amazing radiation of about 400 living primate species to better understand our own biology and our own behavior. In Darwin's world-changing volume on the origins of species by means of natural selection, Darwin wrote that light would be thrown on the origin of man and his history. However, it wasn't until Darwin's 1871 volume on the descent of man that Darwin directly applied concepts of evolution and natural selection to the question of human origins. Needless to say, Darwin's revelation that humans shared a common ancestor with other organisms was not viewed favorably by many con constituencies, Darwin himself was lampooned in many political cartoons, and actually neither humans nor apes actually uh, appreciated Darwin's revelations. Um, there's a political cartoon from the 1870s, this one shown he here, where you have a butler horrified to be introducing to a, um, a high society a very well-dressed ape. But similarly, um, political cartoonists thought that apes were not happy as well, and here is a, a distraught ape at the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, um, horrified that um, Darwin has, been claim, has claimed his pedigree. So I think, to begin with, it's, it's, it, it was very hard for Darwin to please any primate audience. But in my presentation tonight, what I want to focus is on factors that promote pro-social and cooperative behavior in our closest living relatives, the non-human primates. Monkeys and apes provide powerful analogs for understanding the set of social and ecological factors that have influenced and shaped the biology and the evolution of human primates. So I'll begin with a quote from Darwin. This is from Descent of Man. It's on, in his fifth chapter. And Darwin wrote, a tribe including many members who from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy were always ready to aid one another and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over most other tribes and this would be natural selection. Therefore, it's clear that Darwin recognized that among social animals, cooperation can be a powerful evolutionary strategy that provides advantages to individuals who are members of a well-integrated social unit. And I use Darwin's quote uh, tonight to highlight the importance of cooperative behavior, not only in human societies, but also in non-human primate societies. And I will argue tonight that cooperate, cooperation and affiliative behaviors 
represent the core of primate social interactions. In this regard, several researchers have noted that primates may differ from many other animal lineages in that they show rather good evidence of cooperation, especially in long-term relationships. Moreover, it's been suggested that cooperation represents a fundamental part of the human adaptive pattern and that compared to other primates, humans engage more commonly in within-group and between-group cooperation, whereas cooperation in most species of non-human primates is often at the level of dyads between two individuals or with the ability to, of humans to engage in highly complex patterns of cooperative behavior, resource sharing, and resource exchange, both within a community and between communities, appears to be dependent on language, culture, and the advantages of both small and large-scale patterns of community integration. And I'm going to get back to this point towards the end of my talk. But with this in mind, I have several goals for the presentation tonight. Um, first, I'll begin by providing a little bit of background on primate evolution, discuss the consequences of a slow life history or an extended period of juvenile development for understanding primate group living, and outline the benefits to individuals of living in a well-integrated social unit. I'll also discuss some problems with current models of primate socioecology that tend to focus or emphasize on the costs rather than the benefits of group living. I'll pre present some data then on primate social interactions and outline the benefits to individuals, uh, excuse me, and um, provide a few examples of cooperative behavior and collective action found in wild primates. I also will present some data from functional magnetic resonance imaging studies and studies using the intranasal administration of oxytocin on humans that examine the role of neurotransmitters and neurohormones in reinforcing and promoting pro-social and cooperative behavior. Finally, I'm going to end my talk tonight with a brief discussion of a proposed link among language, trust, and cooperative behavior in the course of human evolution. Now, for centuries, philosophers, theologians, and behavioral and biological scientists have theorized about the origins and the role of cooperative behavior in human societies and in other animals. In human societies, cooperation among both kin and non-kin is pervasive and takes many forms, such as altruism, reciprocity, and mutualisms. Human cooperation is expressed at the level of dyads or between individuals, um, at the level of subgroups or, or networks within small sets of individuals, within entire communities, and between different communities. And although many have argued that um, natural selection is generally described in terms of differential survival and reproductive success among individuals, there are multi-level effects of natural selection such that individuals living in more highly integrated or more effectively functioning social units may have higher reproductive success or enhanced fitness compared to individuals living in less well-functioning social units. So I'd like to begin with a, my first question, and, and that's simply, why be social? Primate sociality has its roots in mammalian biology and behavior, as both human and non-human primates express the basic mammalian system of infant caregiving, um, nursing and lactation, and intimate visual, olfactory, uh, and vocal contact between an infant and its mother. However, primates differ or are distinct from any other mammalians in uh, mammalian lineages in possessing a large adult brain size, an expansion of areas of the brain associated with memory and complex decision making, and this involves the ability to use or integrate both social and ecological information in making decisions. Primates are characterized by highly acute visual abilities, including color vision, the ability to discriminate fine detail, and also very complex facial recognition. Primates are characterized by a single offspring at birth, 
And as I mentioned before, a slow life history characterized by a relatively long period of maturation and social dependence. It's important to underscore that many of the traits that distinguish primates from other mammals evolved early in primate evolution. And so, for example, at 55 million years ago, primates already had large brains compared to other mammals that were living at that time. And today, living primates on average have brains about twice as large as would be expected for a mammal of a given body size. Now, I said primates are characterized by an extended period of infancy, an extended juvenile period, and in some species, a period of adolescence or a socially pre-adult phase in which, although physically adult, individuals are not yet socially adult. And given that the infant and juvenile stages of development are often assumed to be periods of great vulnerability, vulnerability to things like predation, disease, and injury, but also periods of intense social learning, primate social organization and patterns of social integration must function to reduce opportunities for aggression and promote tolerance and social bonding between adults and juveniles. And in this regard, it's been argued that during the course of primate evolution, the biological, behavioral, and hormonal mechanisms that were present to promote and maintain a strong mother-infant bond were co-opted and extended to enable juveniles, adolescents, and both kin and non-kin group members to form long-lasting social bonds. And I'll come back a bit later in my talk to briefly uh, describe some of these neurohormonal and neurotransmitter mechanisms. Now, there are many examples I could offer about um, slow primate development, but many of these um, that I'll talk about tonight come from studies of the great apes. And in the wild, young chimpanzees, which are shown here on your right, orangutans on your left, um, young chimpanzees do not attain full locomotor independence until about four to five years of age. Females do not have their first offspring until about 13 to 15 years of age, and thereafter birth space or have an infant every four to six years. And thus by age 25, a female chimp will at most have produced two offspring each of which is still dependent on their mother. Male chimpanzees usually do not reach a full, full adulthood till about 15 to 17 years of age. And in the case of orangutans, they even have a slower pattern of life history and development. Infant orangutans may not reach full locomotor independence until ages five to six. Females give birth in the wild, usually between ages 12 to 16 years. And females orangutans birth space or have an infant approximately every seven to nine years, an incredibly slow period of development. And uh, in the case of male orangutans, and I love this photograph, this is an amazing creature, um, male orangutans, um, when they're fully mature, have these very dimorphic patterns, a large throat sac, fleshy pads on their face, um, a beard. Um, male orangutans may not reach this dimorphic state till sometime between 16 and 20 years of age. Now another example of delayed primate ontogeny um, and an extended period of learning involves tool use in chimpanzees. Wild chimpanzees naturally use a variety of twigs and leaves and branches and stones as tools. And from birth, young chimpanzees have the opportunity, as for example shown in this slide, to observe their mothers, siblings, and other community members manufacture and solve problems using tools. Yet, in the case of using hammer and anvil stones to open hard nuts, which is being depicted in this slide, it's not until age seven that juveniles have reached the level of efficiency such that the energy intake they receive uh, from cracking nuts exceeded the energy intake that they would obtain just by consuming nuts that were opened by their mother. And despite the fact that juvenile chimps engage in nut cracking on a regular basis, they do not reach adult proficiency until about 11 years of age. So overall, given this general primate pattern of slow growth, the social environment needs to act as a critical buffer, providing young individuals with the time and opportunities 
to develop the requisite cognitive and social skills needed as an adult. Now, virtually all primates live in social groups, and these are principally bisexual. They contain uh, both males and females, and are composed of individuals of all age classes. And although changes in group size and composition occur through deaths and migrations and births, sets of related and unrelated individuals may remain together in groups for periods of months, years, and in some cases decades. Group, group living requires that these individuals form predictable social relationships, explore a common set of resources, defend a common range, and de develop strong affiliative social bonds. And so within a primate group then, infants first see or know the world by clinging to their mother, as shown here in this slide of gorillas. But then once they start becoming a bit more independent, they're literally given an adult eye view into their dynamic social and ecological world. I always think of uh, these young primates as almost anthropologists in training because they're like little ethnographers learning about the world, their social and ecological world by riding on their mother's back. Young primates maintain a close social and emotional bond with their mothers, older siblings, age mates, and they often form playgroups, and other adults, and thus young individuals grow up in groups that include members that span several generations, and again, have the opportunity to form enduring long-term social relationships. Well, with this as a background, we can then ask the question, what are the advantages of living in social groups? As I said, virtually all primates live in uh, cohesive and stable social groups. And although um, there are many reasons people have argued of the advantages for living in a social group, I'm going to focus on three of them in my talk today. One of the advantages is opportunities for individuals to learn information by observing others. An observation or social learning enables individuals to acquire new information and solve problems encountered in their social and ecological environment by taking advantage of what we might call group-based or shared knowledge. Although social learning may be considered a form of parasitism in which the learner benefits at the expense of the demonstrator or the model, the relationship certainly has the potential to be symbiotic as the learner and the model exchange roles over time. Social learning is likely to provide significant advantages to all group members, but especially juveniles and recent immigrants into the group. So, so one of the advantages of group living then, it provides benefits to individuals. A second advantage is opportunities to develop reciprocal alliances and friendships that provide comfort, support, protection, access to, or exchange of resources, and a safe place to practice skills that enhance fitness and survival. And in this case, friendships offer benefits to both individuals or individuals that form dyads. And a third advantage is opportunities, opportunities to benefit from collective action or behaviors in which the joint and coordinated actions of several individuals are more effective than the lone action of any single individual. And this could include things like group hunting, food sharing, food calls and information exchange, predator vigilance, collective infant caregiving, cooperative resource and mate defense, or even just huddling among several individuals as a form of thermoregulation. So, and this would provide benefits to individuals that form cliques or subgroups. Now, although several theories exist concerning the benefits to individuals of group living, the predominant view of primate sociality today and I would argue it's, it's, a, it's mistaken, focuses um, on the costs to individuals of group living. And these theories are often grouped together in the primate literature within a single framework referred to as the socio-ecological model. The socio-ecological model focuses on feeding competition and within group aggression as fundamental costs to individuals of living in a social group, but in addition, they, they consider these as fundamental organizing principles in understanding primate social interactions, dominance hierarchies, and individual fitness. And for example, in their paper on the evolution of female social relationships in primates, 
Sturk et al. state, within group competition for food and safe positions is a virtually inevitable and universal cost of group living. These authors argue that agonistic relationships are an especially important organizing feature in primate groups and that gregariousness leads to feeding competition with the strength of the contest component of competition for resources largely determining primate social relationships. Within such a framework, survival within the group would best be accomplished through aggression, deception, and social manipulation, or what sometimes has been called Machiavellian intelligence. The idea that competition and aggression are central to understanding the origins of group living and sociality in human and non-human primates echoes many of the 17th century ideas of the extremely influential political and English moral philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes argued that the state of nature closely resembles a civil war, a situation of universal insecurity where all have reason to fear violent death and where rewarding human cooperation is all but impossible. Hobbes argued that humans are not social by nature, uh, but made social by contract. And similarly, T.H. Huxley, an associate of Darwin, emphasized this Hobbesian perspective of Darwinian evolution and human nature, stating that life is a relentless struggle for existence that requires a gladiatorial spirit. Now, a Hobbesian perspective continues today in books like Richard Wrangham's volume on the demonic male, Apes and the Origins of Human Violence, or a recent article in the New York Times Science section, this was in June 2010, uh, suggesting that humans and chimps inherited an instinct for aggressive ter territoriality from their joint ancestor who lived some five million years ago. Considerably less emphasis has been placed on cooperative, coordinated and mutually beneficial affiliative behavior as an organizing principle of primate social interactions and the important insights this offers for understanding cooperation in humans. So what I'd like to do is begin summarizing the results of a recent review uh, by my colleague Bob Sussman from Washington University and myself on the rate of affiliative and agonistic um, interactions in primates. And we uh, present data on 28 different genera and 60 species of non-human primates and then ask a very simple set of questions. The first is simply, how much time do primates spend each day in overt social interactions? How frequently do individuals engage in aggressive and affiliative behaviors? And what are the contexts of aggressive and affiliative behaviors? We found that Non-human primates spend between 1 and 28 percent of their day, the average per species is usually about 10, engaged in overt or direct social interactions. The overwhelming number of these involve grooming, which is sort of shown here on this slide of chimpanzees, um, grooming, huddling, and playing, which are affiliative or bonding behaviors. Among adults, grooming is a major component in primate social life. It occurs principally among friends or preferred social partners, is correlated with alliance formation, plays an important role in reconciliation and in reducing social stress, and offers psychological and emotional support. Studies indicate that being groomed can lower heart rate and glucocorticoid levels, both of which are indicators of anxiety or stress, and tactile contact associated with grooming can result in the release of endorphins or endogenous opioids that in both humans and non-human primates can lead to feelings of trust, well-being, and promote social bonding. One thing that's interesting about these interactions is that these hormonal changes have been documented to occur both in the, in the individual being groomed, but also in the individual who's doing the grooming. And given that the energetic costs associated with grooming are extremely low, and that grooming often occurs during periods of rest or inactivity, time engaged in reciprocal grooming may represent one of the most effective social investments used by primates to form, reestablish, and maintain preferred social bonds. Now, in our sample, again, 
um, of about 60 primate species, we found that 93% of all social interactions in prosimians, prosimians are things like lemurs and lorises, they're um, primates, 86% of new world monkeys, 85% in old world monkeys, and 96% of the social interactions in apes were reported as affiliative. Moreover, these data do not include actually the majority of a primate day during which group members are in close spatial proximity, resting, traveling, and feeding peacefully, but not engaged in direct or overt social interactions. Clearly, affiliative behaviors represent the overwhelming majority of primate social interactions and form the basis of individual social bonds. These same studies report that considerably less than 1% of the primate daily activity budget involves agonistic or aggressive behavior. And in most cases, aggressive behavior in primates occur at a rate of less than one event per individual per several months. So what I'd like to sort of focus on now is briefly describe and illustrate some mechanisms that are suggested to promote cooperative behaviors in primates. One of these is kin selection or is kin selection, and kinship may help to explain the presence of altruistic behaviors under conditions in which the direct cost to the initiator of the altruistic act is high, and the direct benefit to the recipient also is high. Um, again, also the, certainly the initiator and the recipient are closely related and that the altruist gains indirect benefits through increased inclusive fitness. This model also assumes that altruistic behavior is highly heritable and that individuals can recognize or discriminate kin based on their degree of relatedness. And although I would argue that well-documented examples of kin selection are rare in the primate literature, examples of kin-biased behaviors or kin-favored behaviors are actually very common. And in this regard, um, I can use the example of Murray Keys. They're also called woolly spider monkeys. They're New World monkeys. They're noteworthy in that males are characterized by strong intrasexual tolerance. Males are highly tolerant of each other and have strong social bonds. Murray Key males are phylopatric, and that means that males remain in the groups in which they're born, so they form patrilines, whereas females migrate from their natal group. Data collected over the course of almost three decades uh, by Karen Stryer from the University of Wisconsin indicate that the number of adult males co-residing in the same group can range from as many as 6 to 20. Female murikis mate with several adult males during the same day or fertile period, and males are highly tolerant of the mating behavior of other resident males. Moreover, behaviors such as grooming, spatial proximity and embracing, which is a greeting gesture, occur more frequently between adult males than between male-female pairs or female-female pairs. The rate of aggressive interactions among community males is extremely low across all activities, and males act collectively in patrolling the borders of their range and cooperatively engage in mate defense against males from neighboring groups. It's been argued that since male murikis spend their entire life in their natal group, that cooperation and intrasexual tolerance is influenced by social relationships mediated through kinship. So certainly there are some examples where it appears that uh, kinship is playing a very important role in primate cooperative and affiliative behavior. However, recent studies on several species of non-human primates also indicate that affiliative and cooperative behaviors are common among unrelated or distantly related group members. And for example, in the case of common chimpanzees, measures of social affiliation among males, such as proximity, coalition formation, meat sharing, and patrolling behavior, occur more frequently among non-relatives of similar age and social rank than among close relatives. And therefore, we might expect that factors such as partner competency and partner reliability, irrespective of relatedness, are perhaps the most significant factors affecting the costs and benefits in nature of primate social interactions. Well, in addition to kinship, there are other mechanisms 
that also appear to promote cooperative behavior and social bonding among both kin and non-kin primates. And these include mutualisms or reciprocity. Mutualisms, and it's shown here on this cartoon where um, one individual is grooming another, so the, groom, the groomee is getting benefited, uh, is getting a benefit, as well as the groomer who's getting a tasty little bug off his back. Mutualisms represent a class of cooperative behaviors in which both the initiator and the recipient receive an immediate reward or benefit. And perhaps the most common form of mutualism is called byproduct mutualism. Byproduct mutualism is associated with affiliative, co coordinated, and cooperative behaviors involving low or no additional cost to the actors because they would perform that behavior regardless of living alone or living in a group. And these could be things like predator vigilance, for example, or searching for food. Partners are each expected to benefit from these coordinated behaviors because the collective action of any of several individuals are more effective than the lone action of any single individual. Byproduct mutualism may represent the simplest type of cooperation between, be, because neither kin recognition nor complex scorekeeping mechanisms are needed for its development. Now, um, an example of the mutual benefits of collective action um, is uh, joint uh, group defense in howler monkeys. And actually, I may need to exit the show for a second because my, the, uh, so I could, you can hear this. So I can put, I didn't have the sound up on my computer. I got it, I think. No, I think it's, I think it should be okay now. I didn't have the sound on my computer, okay. so. I, didn't know if I don't know if it's on here. We can try it. Okay. Go ahead. Well, let, let's try it first and then we can see if it works. Well, it's not that loud. It's only probably going through my computer. Uh, you, oh. You can replay it that way. Okay. I'll try it again. I'm not sure how loud it's going to be. Um, this is just an example. This is a group of, um, of um, howler monkeys that a colleague of mine, Martin Kowaluski, and I studied in Argentina. Um, our group here, as you can see, was composed of four adult males. Um, and these adult males were not closely related. We, have, we know that based on genetic information. But the males acted cooperatively in howling. Um, and they use these howls commonly about uh, twice a day. Sometimes these howling bouts between different groups occur over the course or can, ex can take at least an hour of time. Um, but by acting collectively or cooperatively, um, uh, the, each individual benefits because groups with more individuals or more adult males that howl together um, are able to um, uh, displace other groups from their area. So let me see if I can see if we can get this louder. It's not that loud. Well, this is actually as exciting as it gets when you're studying monkeys in the wild. So, <laughs> although you may be all become future primatologists. Um, uh, it's a lot of time sitting and listening to howlers making these sounds. Um, but again, it's, uh, we have some evidence that all males are likely to benefit by their joint or collective action in these territorial encounters, as I say, because groups that have more males acting together or collectively um, end up being more successful in defending their range from other, uh, other groups. Now, another form um, of uh, or factor that's uh, a mechanism that can promote social or cooperative behavior is reciprocity. And this occurs when two individuals exchange beneficial services such as tolerance at a feeding site or grooming over time. So reciprocity differs from mutualism. In mutualism, both individuals benefit at the same time. Whereas in reciprocity, one individual, A helps B, but then um, uh, B or, or A has to wait over some period of time, uh, could be hours, days, weeks before um, B, uh, b before A re uh, B reciprocates. And this is analogous to what Trivers described as a tit for tat strategy in which each of two partners repeats the last action of the other 
and thus the cost to the cooperator of non-cooperation by a defector or cheater is relatively low. All you lose is your initial investment. Moreover, a behavioral rule such as continue to cooperate until the first time your partner defects is a strong sanction discouraging non-cooperation. Now, models of reciprocity require that individuals recognize other group members, that there's frequent opportunities to reciprocate, that individuals maintain predictable social relationships um, and discriminate against cheaters, and that the direct benefits gained by each partner through cooperation and affiliative interactions are relatively equal or balanced over time. They don't have to be exactly equal, but there needs to be some balance. And reciprocity and association with grooming, coalitionary support, and food sharing between related and unrelated individuals has been reported in many primate species. And I'll use now chimpanzees as a, uh, as a good example of this. In this slide, what you have here is these are several adult male chimpanzees actually sharing a carcass. It's a red colobus monkey, which is one of the most common prey items that chimpanzees hunt and, uh, and feed on. Um, so again, adult male chim chimpanzees hunt together and engage in food sharing. And although some hunts appear to be opportunistic, in other cases, several male chimps first aggregate together and then begin to hunt, giving the appearance of a planned event. Capturing these arboreal red colobus monkeys requires the coordinated efforts of several individuals. At one site in Uganda, studied by David Watts and John Mitani of, of the University of Michigan, they report that chimpanzees hunted red colobus monkeys 10 times per month, were successful 84% of the time, and captured 213 monkeys in a single year. Now, <clears throat> Uh, this, the next few slides come from their, uh, their field research, but they found that the number of adult males present was a significant predictor of whether chimps initiated a hunt and how successful they were in obtaining prey. So here you can simply see that hunting party sizes of one through five were successful maybe about 30% of the time, but then there's a big increase on hunting parties of six to 10, and even over 20 are significantly more successful. They're successful maybe 80 to almost 95 percent of the time. So there are advantages to these chimpanzees of collective action or cooperative hunting. These authors also found that the amount of prey captured, um, and this was in kilograms or weight, was also positively correlated with the number of male participants. So again here this is the number of male participants and you can see uh, a strong positive relationship. The more males that participate, the more prey or the, the greater weight of prey ultimately um, are, are captured. And finally, their data also indicate the, that the amount of meat consumed per individual or per capita is also positively correlated with the number of male participants. So not only are chimps more successful when they have more males acting together and that they capture or obtain um, more quantities of, of meat, but also each individual involved in the hunt also gets more meat. Now several hypotheses have been proposed to explain male cooperative hunting and food sharing in chimps. However, uh, Matani and Watts provide evidence in support of what they call the social bonding hypothesis, in which certain sets of males shared meat more frequently with each other, and meat sharing between these males was reciprocated. In addition, Males who shared meat also engaged in uh, exchanged food for other forms of aid, such as co coalitionary support or grooming. Now, another example of collective action occurs in a group of primates called tamarins and marmosets, and I've studied several species of tamarind monkeys in Panama, Peru, Brazil, and Bolivia. Tamarins are, are usually called cooperative breeders, although I would argue that cooperative infant caregivers is a more accurate term to describe the high levels of within-group male cooperation in transporting, protecting, and provisioning or sharing food with the group's offspring. Within a tamarind group, all or most resident adult males copulate with the group's single breeding female, and uh, she gives birth to twin offspring. And that, this is the only major group, uh, group of, of monkeys, apes, or humans who twin all the time as, as, uh, as a rule. 
Now, this slide just uh, illustrates a male. This is an adult male cotton top tamarind sharing food with an infant. Infants, in fact, will give um, particular calls to solicit food from adult males. Adult males care for the infants more than the, mother, the infant's mother does. I also mentioned that they twin, um, and this is, again is a male carrying both infants. At about one month of age, the infants weigh about one-third of, of an adult male's weight. So this is really costly for the male to carry, carry these infants through the forest. And so what you have in these groups is that several males will act together um, in helping transport the infants, uh, protecting the infants, and providing food for the infants. And a study that uh, I conducted several years ago in Peru on mustache tamarinds um, uh, indicated that there was a strong positive relationship uh, between infant survivorship and the number of male helpers in a group. And what we found was that groups with more than two adult male helpers had greater success in rearing infants to the juvenile stage of maturation. So in this slide, this is based on 32 groups of mustache tamarins we observed in Peru. Here are the number of adult males or females. Um, this is the number of surviving offspring. And here in the black dots represent the number of males in a group, and the white dots represent the number of females. There's no relationship between infant survivorship or no positive relationship and the number of females, whereas once you have two and more adult males, um, there's a, a significant or dramatic increase in infant survivorship. It has been argued that male cooperation in tamarins is driven by factors such as female mate choice, with breeding females preferring to mate with males that help care for her twin offspring. There's also evidence that physical contact with the infants increases adult male prolactin levels. Prolactin is a hormone commonly associated with infant caregiving and maternal behavior. And so um, the contact with the infant appears to be reinforced both through, uh, both by this hormonal mechanism and um, helps males develop a strong bond with infants that are born into the group. In some cases, these infants may be fathers. In other cases, these infants are not fathers. And finally, a third type of uh, sort of reciprocity or another type is third-party cooperation, or what we call indirect reciprocity. And it's another mechanism that can promote cooperative behavior. Indirect reciprocity requires that animals know something about their own social relationships and the social relationships of others. And it would be argued that this would require something that's called a theory of mind. A theory of mind in, is, is the idea that not only do I know what I know, but I know what you know. And it's been argued, certainly, that theory of mind exists in humans. Um, some people have argued there's evidence that theory of mind exists in apes. We have no evidence that theory of mind um, exists in, um, in monkeys. But in the case of humans, indirect reciprocity is based on notions of reputation and trust within a social community. So in this case, A gives to B, and this is observed or communicated somehow to individual C, who cooperates with A because A is known, to be a, uh, is known to cooperate or has a reputation for helping others. In the case of humans, things like language, dress, and other forms of symbolic communication and community norms may help to perpetuate notions of trust, fairness, and cooperation. And the moralistic assessment of other members in the population, even if they're only observed at a distance, provides a powerful tool for channeling support towards those who will collaborate and provides an incentive to join group efforts. Now what I'd like to do for a, a few minutes is to briefly describe neurohormonal mechanisms that might lead to cooperative behavior among related and non-related individuals, but that do not necessitate selfish genes, complex calculations of kin recognition or social relationships, or complicated predictions of future reciprocity. And these involve reward or pleasure centers in the brain. And in experiments using functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, mutual cooperation has been associated in humans with activation in three broad areas of the brain that have been linked with reward processing. And these are the caudate nucleus, the orbitofrontal cortex, 
and the antroventral striatum. Now, each of these brain areas are rich in receptor cells that respond to dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that affects brain processes that control movement, emotional response, and the ability to experience pain and pleasure. The dopamine system evaluates rewards, both those that flow from the environment and those that may be conjured up in the brain. And with these systems, inve investigators believe that they've identified a pattern of neural activation that may be involved in maintaining cooperative social relationships, perhaps by labeling cooperation as rewarding or pleasurable. Now, there also is a related mechanism associated with affiliation, nurturing, and the formation of strong social bonds, and that's involved with neuroendocrine uh, circuitry associated with maternal responses in mammals. And orchestrating this broad suite of behavioral responses are two related neuropeptides, oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin has been related to every type of animal bonding, parental, fraternal, sexual, as well as in cooperation, trust, and social recognition. When released into synapses in the brain, oxytocin acts as a neurotransmitter and a neurohormone. And although its primary role or its original role appears to be in association with reproduction and in forging infant mother bonds, oxytocin's ability to influence dopamine release may have been co-opted to reinforce both mother juvenile bonds and to prime or stimulate neuroreceptors in juveniles, mothers, and other adults to regulate, reward, and reinforce bonding, alliances, friendships, and cooperative behaviors. Now, recent studies examining trust and cooperation in humans have consistently shown that these neuroendocrine reward uh, systems are present and function. And people have done this by using variants of what's called the prisoner's dilemma game. And what they what they uh, currently use is they administer oxytocin intranasally. And the administration of oxytocin in a game where you need to decide if you're going to share with others um, Oxytocin increase, the presence of oxytocin increases trust or the administration of oxytocin and the amount of money an investor will provide another individual. It's also very interesting that this oxytocin effect uh, did not occur when a participant random, randomly received money from a computer generated lottery. It did require interactions with other people indicating that some form of personal social attachment or interaction was needed to prime this concept of, uh, of individual trust. In related experiments, they also found that individuals who are shown trust, who are not given oxytocin, but just are shown trust by another, uh, were found to have a 41% increase in oxytocin levels. And this may be analogous to what we've seen in non-human primates during grooming, when both the groomer and the groomee uh, have physiological changes and endocrine changes um, through this type of social interactions. Now, humans engage in reciprocal acts of cooperation in many contexts, including the exchange of goods and services, information, favors, and obligations. And humans are very good at identifying individuals that fail to cooperate and prescribe sanctions against cheaters or what we sometimes call free riders. Again, using functional magnetic resonance imaging, there's evidence that there exist areas of the human brain that are particularly responsive to acts of non-cooperation and serve to recognize or identify cheaters. Thus, both human and non-human primates appear to be primed, in a sense, to cooperate, to reduce stress by seeking each other's company and trust, and to identify individuals who act as non-cooperators or cheaters. Now, these endocrine mechanisms make cooperation rewarding by providing an immediate social payoff, even under conditions when the material payoff is delayed. And therefore, even when the material reward finally is provided, this may act as then a second reinforcer, reinforcing this overall set of cooperative acts. Thus, there is considerable evidence that social affiliation and cooperation provide psychological, physiological, social, and ecological benefits that are reinforced by hormonal and neurological systems. 
Well, finally, I'd like to conclude my talk by offering some ideas concerning the role of cooperation in human evolution. And several lines of evidence indicate that initial increases in human brain size, the birth of underdeveloped young, tool use and tool manufacture, a division of labor, complex planning, and food sharing appear early in human evolution at least perhaps some two million years ago. However, modern human behavior does not appear in the archaeological record until approximately 70,000 years ago. Modern human behavior is associated with living in a culturally constructed environment in which the planned use of space and resources was dependent on shared information, assistance, and knowledge through interconnected social and trade networks among several local groups distributed across the landscape. Now, in a 2010 article published in the journal Current Anthropology by Stanley Ambrose, who's a colleague of mine at, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois, uh, Stan argued that in the evolution of modern human behavior, reinforcement of group identity and intergroup alliances occurred through the use of common symbols, technology, and language that serves as tags linking together networks of spatially distinct social and ethnic groups and communities. And this may help to explain a, a critical distinction between non-human primates who cooperate with a relatively small set of individuals who reside within their social group and humans who have successfully expanded the effectiveness and complexity of cooperation beyond individuals and beyond subgroups to include large interconnected social networks that span many groups. Ambrose proposed that building on a more general primate neuroendocrine receptor system associated with oxytocin and dopamine, that innovations in non-threatening grammatical constructions such as the conditional, subjunctive, future, and third person engendered trust and cooperation. He argues that the language of compliments, flattery, and friendships may have substituted for social grooming, again, non-human primates rely principally on social grooming, to stimulate neurologically active hormones to increase trust, generosity, reciprocity, and other affiliative behaviors. Just thus, during the course of human evolution, and certainly in the case of modern human behavior, advances in language, culture, and technology appear to have moved cooperation from a small-scale endeavor into a large-scale intercommunity-based network of shared exchanges, trades, gifts, and responsibilities in which reputation and trust fostered both direct and indirect reciprocity, leading to something that people have called the language of diplomacy or flattery. Now, I want to close uh, by returning to Darwin's ideas regarding cooperation as a powerful evolutionary strategy that offers advantages to individuals who are members of a cohesive and well-integrated social unit. Using a Darwinian paradigm, mental and linguistic abilities that evolved in human ancestors for some initial purpose, such as perhaps cooperative hunting, resource sharing, uh, collective infant caregiving, explaining technological information, or organizing within group relationships may have been co-opted in response to changing ecological and sociocultural conditions for a new function associated with expanding levels of trust, large-scale cooperation, and the development of social and trade networks that could span entire regions or even continents. And I would argue if, if this is correct, then the roots of what we now cl call globalization which has often been regarded as a relatively recent or a 21st century phenomenon, phenomenon of the digital age, is in fact far more ancient than previously thought and has been a core or fundamental part of human behavior, culture, and sociality for a very long time. So I end by just thanking you for your uh, attention, patience, and your cooperation. And I want to wish a happy birth 20, 203rd birthday to Charles Darwin. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I'll go back there. Yeah.
Okay, that's a really interesting question. I don't know if everyone could hear. It's a question regarding, uh, in this case, bonobos, which are one species of African ape, and, and baboons, which are African old world monkeys. But the question of, there are certainly differences in the social system among many different primates. Bonobos are often characterized uh, by a lot of both social and sexual behavior, and often use sexual behavior, often in ways that other primates may use grooming, for example. Um, we don't really know. I mean, in, in many cases, we haven't, it's been easier to, to identify these, uh, uh, these different hormonal mechanisms in humans because we can, it, you can take a, hu a, a human who will volunteer and do uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So often we don't know if there are um, either, either some of these receptors, there are more receptors or the receptors are primed to respond more quickly. What we would suggest, I think, is that um, apes, at least, as best as we can tell, most people would argue that apes have this idea of theory of mind, that they can watch you do something and then know what information you have. We have no evidence of that in monkeys, although these are difficult concepts to sort of tease out. Um, the experiments we have to do, um, the natural kind of experiments are very indirect. But we might, the, the, what we would suggest certainly is that probably bonobos have a much better understanding, or apes in general, about motivations of individuals, maybe things like reputation, trust, a better sense of previous and past experiences, and, and maybe are better at then using that information to plan how they might behave or interact um, in the next setting. So it would be very interesting. And um, I, I think one thing which, uh, in some ways it's an aside, but those who are aspiring anthropologists or primatologists um, we have lots of questions about non-human primates and generally few answers um, because the discipline of primatology is really very recent. Studying non-human primates in the wild anyway, not in captivity, there's been a lot of long-term work in, in psychology departments, but actually the first studies of primates in the wild by anthropologists uh, were done about 1956 and 1957, and I know that sounds like a long time ago for you, but um, basically, um, for some primates, we have 30 or 40 years of data. But for most primates, we have very little information. So there's lots of, lots of work that we need to do. And that, from it, I don't find that frustrating. I find that exciting because we're ready for new generations of, of researchers and primatologists and anthropologists. But thank you for your question. Yeah. My point being that establishing the hierarchy may contribute to the later effectiveness of behavior, positive behavior against uh, an outside aggressor. Sure, sure. And I guess um, in, in some ways um, I was trying to, uh, I'll say, overemphasize cooperation or affiliation, and in part because, uh, as I tried to uh, briefly state, I think the literature, it's too easy, and our language allow us too easily to talk about competition um, when, um, what we're, uh, when what we see is two individuals interacting on a particular day. We define that somehow as a competition, and we don't necessarily know whether there are really long-term uh, consequences of these behaviors. What we find is that um, hierarchies in primates, and if I focus on, let's say, the tamarind monkeys that I've been studying, I don't know if you had a particular uh, chimps or whatever, um, there are certainly differences among species in, um, in uh, dominance relationships, um, although it's still not clear that dominant animals that we call dominant, who dominance is usually, the problem is dominance is usually determined by aggressive interactions, which do not all the time or always correlate with access to resources or access to mates. Sometimes it does certainly, but sometimes it doesn't. And so one of the problems is if we base the dominance hierarchy on who grooms who, or on who shares food with whom, or who huddles with whom, we would probably come up with a different dominance hierarchy than if we base it on aggressive interactions. Okay. Um, so what we find, I guess what I, what I was trying to argue is that 
both cooperation or affiliation and aggression are parts of social life. You can't have social groups with, without having both. The question is the context and its role in structuring and organizing the groups. And although dominance plays a role, I would, or, or aggression I, uh, plays a role, I would argue that primates have developed many ways of mediating that. One of the ways, for example, in the, in the monkeys, the tamarins, and marmosets that I study, we might expect, since all, the groups often contain more than one female, but only one female gives birth in a group. Um, and so one might think that that would be a setting where you would expect lots of aggression going on. And in these tamarins, um, uh, well, since only one female gives birth, there's limited breeding or siring opportunities for males. But if I, if I use the word competition, a lot of, often we have evidence that they're competing chemically, not they're competing, competing using scent and scent marks that end up suppressing or uh, causing avoidance and not often using direct aggression. So I can watch a tamarind group. One study I did for the course of a year, there were, let's say, eight animals in the group. Over the course of the entire year, I only observed eight cases of, um, of aggression. And in those cases, um, there was no way to determine a hierarchy based on aggression anyway. So there are certainly some primates um, particularly some primate males, in males in some species that are aggressive. There are some primate species where only one, groups have only one male. Um, and, um, and males are very, I would say overall, primates tend to be more aggressive towards members outside their group than members within the group, I guess. So, I mean, it's an, it, it's an interesting question. Um, it's far from clear that these, these hierarchies are, 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 appear to be much more complicated than, um, than often we imagine. And some groups of primates have been called egalitarian, where I, I won't say there's not a hierarchy, but it's really subtle. Any other questions? Well, then I thank you for your patience and your time. Oh, sorry, I missed. Well, is, this, is this material available online for us to look at later? Um, I guess um, they're taping it. Um, I mean, if you want to email me, I can send you some articles on some of these things if you'd like. That, that would, my email is just p dash or hyphen garber at illinois.edu. Please do, and I'll send you some. some. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Our display in the library also has reprints of our speakers for the week, which is a display for this particular week in the library. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Would you please join me in thanking our speakers? Thank you.